for some of you, you might appreciate that, but, uh, you know, these are my boys, um, jo Joshua and Samuel, some of you know them, some of you don't, but I'm so thankful to be their father and for my wife. Um, we, de we definitely have a vision for their lives, but something first I wanted to tell you about me. God's designed me to be a true visionary. Um, in, in, all, in all ways, I can see things that have not yet been. Um, he gave me vision for this ministry. Um, we we're blessed to have Pastor Phil with us, and then uh, the families that have joined us, including Ryan, who you've just heard. Um, but, you know, though he's designed me as a visionary, one that can see into the future, see things uh, that are to be, um, that doesn't necessarily mean by default that I'm going to have an ability to uh, love, nurture, and train people to walk out that vision. Just because you can see vision does it not mean you can impart vision. And yet that's where the Holy Spirit comes into play. And so, um, left to my own default reactions, truth be told, I would try to control outcomes. Um, not necessarily in a malicious way many times, but sometimes in the spirit of excellence, um, I desire to um, want to see things turn out well. I'm sure we all do, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, control is a good thing, right? So just being obedient to God, trusting Him, letting the Holy Spirit lead you, um, that's where you can kind of surrender from the shackle of, of control and walk forth in power and might of the Holy Spirit. With my boys, though, the reason why I put their, their picture up, um, you know, Jen and I definitely have a vision for their, for their lives. Um, we believe, we have faith for that they will become uh, men of God that uh, will accomplish great things. And, I could explain specifically what I think I've even seen already about what God's purposes are for their lives individually, perhaps a different sermon for a different day. But the reality is, even though um, we have that vision, God has something greater for them. Our job is to be faithful in training them and nurturing them through the process of hopefully fulfilling what God has vision for their lives, not necessarily what their mother and I do. Um, nurturing really is helping to mature a vision that really uh, is about bringing maturity into people's lives. And again, regardless of your age, it doesn't matter if you're four or five years old or times, times that by five or six. Um, God desires us to walk in maturity he desires, and, and, and truth be told, we can all hear, hear from the Lord. Um, he can speak to our lives. It just requires our obedience to what He's saying. And uh, one thing I've always learned is when you're obedient to God, He will bring greater revelation. And so He expands your vision as you walk forward. Um, realistically, um, we, we want Joshua and Samuel to, to live a righteous life, to um, be nurtured and, and for our love to water them and to, to train them up in the ways of the Lord um, and to show respect for one another and for God and all that they do. But the reality is God gives us seed to sow into their lives by how we love one another at home, you know, you, you could come into the parking lot and boom, put on your smiley face, everything's fine, praise Jesus, and be miserable with one another. And I'm not saying that we were or anything today, but the reality is God gives us seed to sow, and the way to see that get deep roots is by loving one another really well. You know, he, he said that that was the second second command, to, to love your neighbors yourself. And... Um, Part of, part of our job is to create a family atmosphere that is conducive for the supernatural. 
so that the seed God gives us to sow as a couple can find good soil in our children that we're nurturing and training up. And so if you don't have children or children in your home, um, there's people in your lives, in your workplace, there's people in, within your extended family that you have opportunity to nurture, to train, to mentor, to teach, to impart godly values into. When we look at the Word, we look at um, Matthew 13, 1 through 9, the parable of uh, the farmer scattering seed. It says, Later that same day, Jesus left the house and sat beside the lake. And a large, crowd, a large crowd soon gathered around him, so he got into a boat. Then he sat there and taught as the people stood on the, sea, on the seashore. He told many stories in form of parables, such as this one. Listen, a farmer went out to plant some seeds. As he scattered them across his field, some seeds fell on, on a footpath and the birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seeds sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. But the plants soon wilted under the hot sun, and since they didn't have deep roots, they died. Other seeds fell among the thorns that grew up and uh, choked out the tender plants. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much has it been planted? Back to Ryan's point. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. And honestly, a main point that I have today is, you know, God has a divinely inspired vision for our lives individually and collectively now as Live With Purpose Church. We need to contend for God's will in our lives and we do that through our complete obedience to God. So that's a little bit about me, about my kids, but you know, what do we what do we all have in common? We're all made in the image of God. We have that in common. With a desire to live life of deep meaning and purpose, a life that truly makes a difference. And in reality, all for the glory of God. Might not acknowledge that, might not even consciously think that, but we all want to live in a significant way. We all want to make an impact in this world. So we all have that in common. In particular, this ministry that you're now a part of this story, a Live With Purpose Church, even in week two, is focused on making a true difference in the lives of people and the world that we're a part of. I'm going to explain to you today how we got to Conestogo on kind of a wild ride. Um, and we're blessed to be here. But we're not just coming here to put up a service. We're coming here to change people's lives by the work of the Holy Spirit. We're, we're coming with a posture that's, that's humble and contrite in spirit to just say we want to help, we want to love people, we want to be the church outside the church. We just happen to have a building. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us this space, that this church, kind of Stoke United Methodist, has honored us and partnered with us in allowing us to use this space. But we, what we want to do is uh, fan the flame in your lives and those people that will come after this week and beyond. We want to make a meaningful impact in your lives so then you can pay it forward and do the same thing in, in the lives of other people. Starting with this town in Conestoga, and then going out from there. So another visual, this is my dad's uh, grave. Eventually my mom's too, and weirdly enough, we even have land next to that for Jen and I one day. But, though we could be buried there, that's not where things end. And so we've got residency in heavenly places, and we say thank you Jesus for that. The um, reason why I put my dad's uh, tombstone up, uh, loved the guy, missed the guy, um, didn't know Jesus um, back when he was alive. He died in 2004. That's my brother Bob, actually. And um, as, a, as I just said, we have in common that we wanted to have a life of impact. We wanted to make a difference. You know, my dad had vision and dreams for his retirement. 
Um, by the time he found out he had um, lung cancer that spread to his bones in less than a month, he was gone. Boom, life's over, see ya. And at that point, I had to kind of kick into father mode in the family and put the funeral together and do lots of things that a 20-something year old probably doesn't want to do. <laughs> but uh, God taught me a lot through my dad's life. He definitely did, but he actually taught me more through his death because a few months later, um, I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. And though I might not have enough time today to explain that whole story, I'll just say for about five months I was wrestling with God saying, what's the meaning of life? What's this all about? You know, and he did just miraculous things. He, he drew family members that didn't speak to one another back together the day of the eulogy that I spoke. You know, the, the Holy Spirit was speaking through me even before I could acknowledge that that was reality. And though my dad's not here now, if he was, the, the one thing that I would hope that I could say, the, the most meaningful thing that I could say is that, Dad, your, your, your death actually set up a catapult for a higher purpose in my life. And the lives of my family, those that I desire to touch, which is including each of you guys, um, that we would uh, have a life that's so saturated with the unconditional love of God that our sons, Joshua and Samuel, that you just saw, and any other children he gives us, and, and the lives, again, of those that are outside of our family, that the seeds God sows through this ministry find good soil in your lives, that they actually start to produce a harvest. You know, it's... Um, Again, we might harp on this over time, but this space is, this is not the church. We are the church, right? And we're, and if anything, our Live With Purpose wants to help people to be motivated to action, to putting their faith into action in, in real ways. Is it possible that um, God is using Live With Purpose Church to challenge us all towards this higher purpose? This higher purpose isn't me just because I'm standing up here preaching. We each have a higher purpose. You don't have to look at, we, we saw a stunning stat at this conference we were just at this weekend. 2% of the people get paid by the church, the corporate church. 98% of the people that show up don't. And yet the 98% wait for the two to basically lead the charge. We're going to flip that on its head and we're going to say, how about the 98% get up and storm the, the gates of hell. How about the 98% of the people start actually doing it? And this is just simple. It's loving your coworker. You know, meeting them where they're at, not being too busy to actually talk with them. Take them out to breakfast, whatever it is, you know. Help them to know that somebody cares. Look further at the word, too, in uh, Matthew 4, verses 18 and 19. It says, one day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, I love that place I was there, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little further up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father Zebedee, repairing their nets. And he called, he called them to come too. They immediately followed him, leaving their boat and their father behind. That's pretty epic. And I'm not, and I'm, <laughs> I'm not telling you to like, leave your spouse, you know, forget your kids. You know. But what was shown in that, it, even in the very first disciples, that it was just complete obedience. Complete obedience to God. A lot of times that's not convenient, that's not comfortable. Um, but I can tell you, when you're obedient to God, He brings you to great places and He reveals more. And for you to be in the center of God's will for your life, you will never find a better place. You will never find a better place. And so it's our heart as a ministry to help you get to that place and then stay there and to cheer you on. Amen. Always remember, God has a divinely inspired vision for each of your lives, each of your lives and us collectively as a body. We need to contend for God's will in our lives, and we do that through our complete obedience to God.
And I'd like to take a further look at the Word of God, but, but setting that up, uh, just a few points here. Jesus came that we might have a life that is rich, abundant, and satisfying. Also, remember that God has a vision and purpose for our lives. He desires to nurture us and to train us as we follow His leading in our lives. Key in that again, following His leading in our lives. That's how He nurtures us. That's how He trains us so we can train and nurture others. Another key point. God is the central focus in this because God is the author of any divinely inspired vision that's within us. We have no ability on our own to have vision that He has not deposited within us. Does that mean that we can desire things that are contrary to the will of God? Absolutely. Things that would uh, break His heart? Absolutely. But when we have vision for things that will bring Him glory and honor, He gave that to us. He gave us that ability to receive that. That's the good Father that's saying, I want you to know that, my son, my daughter. I want you to know that. Now, be faithful to, to me, be obedient to me, and let's do something with that. Further look at Scripture, to back up what I just said so it's not just Joe-isms, John 10.10. 10. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy, but my purpose, this is Jesus, is to give them a rich, and there we go, satisfying life. It can be translated uh, other ways in different translations. Amplified King James might have it more abundantly, have a life, uh, have and enjoy life and have it in abundance. Romans 8.28 says, if we look further, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose for them. And then we can go further to 1 Peter 4.10. God has given each of you a gift from His great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. There's definitely some stinking thinking that people have where they just like, well, you know, I'm not a preacher. Or I'm not a missionary. And it's like, yeah, you know what? But you're made in God's image. You have gifts. You can be a massive blessing. And so how do you do that? You're just obedient. Be who you are. You don't need to be me. I don't need to be you. And by you being who you are in Christ, God does great things. His purposes are made manifest in your life. And you change the world around you. And that's part of our mission here is starting to change the climate around us in Conestoga. There's good things that are here, don't get me wrong. But we want this, this land, this town to become more and more about the purposes of God. And that's going to be something that we're going to champion. John 15.5 says, Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And again, that goes back to my point about any vision that we have. <laughs> uh, we can only execute the things that bring God glory through our obedience, and yet He, he deposited that seed in us, that vision that He's training and nurturing up with inside of us. And as a reminder again, we should always remember that God has a divinely inspired vision for our lives, each of you individually and us collectively. We need, our responsibility is to contend for God's will in our lives through our complete obedience to God. A lot of times people will make it more complicated than it needs to be. Just obey. Just be obedient. Ask God, believe that He can, by faith, He, he can speak to you and that you can receive. And when you know what He wants you to do, many times it'll be something you know you don't want to do, but you know what you're supposed to do. If you just do that, things start becoming clear. Sometimes we have anxiety and stress, and it's like, ah, oh, what should I do? Oh, but you know what to do. Just do it. And when you do, it's amazing. You're like, why was I all jacked up about that? Why was I, you know? It's, and I almost picture him just laughing, being like, well, I, if you just obey me, I'm going to reveal more, and it's, we're going to get on with this thing that it is the purpose and vision I have for your lives, my son. Two points here. Um, you need to live surrendered to God by faith with a genuine trust in God for all areas of your life. It is impossible to please God without faith. 
This is kind of what we need to do about this, what I'm talking about. Like, what do you do with this message? Through obedience to God, He is faithful to unfold greater revelation to those that walk by faith. I just want to support that in uh, a couple more scriptures, and I'm going to tell you a story about how I got here and why we're here. Uh, James 2.14, faith without good deeds is dead. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not, do not show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? We need to be about action. Galatians 2.20, in the NIV translation. I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who le- live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave up himself for me. If you translate that over, uh, it also goes from live by faith translated to trusting in. Again, back to obey, trust Him and obey completely in every area of your life, not in some areas, not where it's convenient, not where it's comfortable. Just be, leave this space today and go get radical. Like obey Him in everything and watch what happens. I guarantee you good things will start happening. And I'm not going to tell you that everything in your life will be perfect, but when you truly surrender all those things, as I'm going to tell you here in a moment, it's like this epic Holy Spirit roller coaster adventure of fun that it doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, you don't even know what's going to happen next, but He's with you, He walks with you, and He takes you to greater places. So the pictures that are up here, okay, so what's, what's this all about? Um, I love this story, but, you know, again, with the time we have, I'll give you a condensed format of it. There's three pictures, three seasons of how we came to Conestoga. The first one is our home up in Buck Run Estates. The second one is uh, when we had a story in the paper, uh, Kingdom Crossroads, that Ryan was mentioning across the street, that you'll, this ministry will be a part of uh, for our Thursday night gatherings. We have a space there that we're building called the Conestoga Underground. It'll be kind of a hip, casual cafe sort of vibe. And then Ryan and I, with the story um, that uh, some people saw in the advertiser recently, um, but what, it, what happened in this? So basically, <laughs> about two years ago, and this is, this is the reason why I'm sharing this story is it reinforces everything I've just told you. Okay? There's nothing more powerful that I have than the story that I've lived. Some people are like, well, how can you believe in this Jesus? And, like, you know, and it's like, listen to the life I've lived. If I've got anything, I've got that to share. So took two, took Again, crazy things that happened. Two weddings to even be obedient to get married. Um, we were in India. We had three people from different countries, didn't even know me, that said, you're going to be married by the end of this year. And it was going to be confirmed three times that day. Weird stuff. It happened. I was there. It was crazy. The last person, I was doing coaching sessions there, 25 of them, and like literally the last person was the third person. They all said, this, like this strange, like, like, God's watching me. It's like, what's going on? Proposed to Jen. Rock avalanche falls down. We're out in California where I'm proposing. Um, Joshua, the older son, his godparents got hit by the avalanche, come down. Literally in the midst of me getting on my knee and proposing to her, rocks come down at this place that like uh, FDR, the president, spoke at, like a famous place. This probably hasn't happened ever or like decades since rocks have come literally honest in the, in the midst of me being obedient to God because I knew God was saying that Jen was the woman that I was supposed to be with. And so my friends by faith, literally, at first I'm scared and I'm like, what's going to happen? I'm going to hit by these rocks. Uh, you know, and, and before I step, I'm like, I better protect somebody you know, or whatever. And uh, he rebukes the rocks. We have it on video. In Jesus' name, he rebukes them and everything stops in a, in, in, in a second. It was, it was nuts. And there were so many things that were trying to stop our wedding. As we, as we go forward, there's a few things that um, happened. But, you know, I was wrestling with God and I said to you, be obedient to him in all areas of your life. Again, took a second wedding. We finally did get married. Uh, we moved three times, two different states, land in Conestoga have the land. The lawyer tells me to take a picture of a uh, newspaper proving that we didn't start construction yet. It was like a part of a settlement or something. I've never built a home. I didn't know. 
driving past, um, let me go back to a picture. There we go. Back to Kingdom Crossroads, the second picture. Obviously, we're standing there now, but at the time, there wasn't, uh, there was like, it was really run down. There was a four leaf sign manufacturing that was there. I felt clearly the Holy Spirit was saying, stop, pull over. So I did. Got out of the uh, vehicle, told my wife, hold on a second. I'm standing out in front of the window. Uh, it was dusty at the time. I'm looking through it. I'm like, all right, God. And I, I'll do that. I'll be weird. I'll be outside talking to him. And people probably think I'm kooky or something. But I'm like, why am I here? And I don't know about you guys. Some people say they've gotten dreams. God will speak to them through dreams, through different things. Reading the Word certainly will come alive and speak to you. Well, I'm sitting there and I get a word, funnels in my head. It's like if you've ever just seen something, you get a picture, you just you remember something. I got this word, funnels, and I'm like, funnels. I'm like, what the heck? I'm looking through the word. As I look, there's a breakaway table with T-shirts on it, and the T-shirts, as I look closer, have these little characters, and it says funnels on it. And then it was like, boom, like 14 years, flashback. I go back, I'm like, I was there. I was at this place. I was here late at night in a snowstorm. Somebody else drove a vehicle to bring me there. The guy was liquidating furniture from the place for our office. We bought a piece that we actually now brought back sentimentally in uh, one of the meeting rooms. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I remember the story. I remember Ben, the guy that owned the place, all this, that. Why am I here? And I felt like the second thing he said to me, I'm going to give you this place. And I'm like, I don't even know if I want this place. What are you talking about? So, <laughs> so I told her that. We called our realtor on the way to Hawaii and um, had her look into it. Again, long story short, we wind up buying the place. And I remember telling God, I'm like, I'll be obedient to you. As I, I've been communicating to you guys, I'll be obedient to you. I said, but God, you're going to have to part the Red Seas. Every obstacle is going to come against me. You're going to have to make this all happen. And, and it was funny because he's like, I'm going to give you this place. I, I didn't think about it at the time, but it wasn't one building. It was two buildings. And I did uh, purchase it actually with no money out of my pocket. He actually gave it to me. And I didn't even think about that. But the story how it played out with partners, putting money in, the bank threw themselves at us. We had to go through environmental testing, two levels, because there was stuff buried in the ground from a long, long time ago when Wig and Chevy was there and stuff. And, and, and we went through all these things, but it was literally like, God's faithful. I said, park these Red Seas. Okay, now the Main Street didn't rip up out of the ground like the water did back with <laughs> you know, the Egyptians coming after the Israelites, but he did remove every obstacle. And, and, and this is the, the point in, in me sharing that. If you're obedient, God will reveal more. So I obeyed. I trusted him. I obeyed. We moved down to Conestoga. I moved my companies down here. We start renovating those spaces, which are far from done. Um, and I didn't have full vision. but so, so you walk forward in vision, and then he's obedient to give you greater revelation. Six months later, he gives me his heart. that He said, you know, this place where the salon is now used to be the general store. The Conestoga wagons were manufactured. There's so much stuff from down here that's beautiful history that's been lost. The properties became run down and I soar to the town. And yet that changed the minute I was obedient. We came and he started doing a work. And he said, I want you to now not only restore this place to beauty, but I want you to point it back to the cross. I want this place to become about me. And so I understood that. He gave me some vision in the beginning. We've had other companies join us, you know, Christian Financial Advisory. We've had people join us. But I was just obedient. And so he revealed more. And so at that moment, though, that was still, you know, <laughs> me like doing what he said. Live with Purpose Church had no, there was no vision. This, this was birthed about a year ago. Um, I was wrestling with God again, like we tend to do. And, you know, it's like, well, who am I? I'm young, you know, uh, you know. And honestly, we're just transparent. I haven't gone to seminary, all these things. But when you're called, you're called, right? And so you obey God. And he takes care of all the rest of the things. You know, a lot of us live in this world like trying to accomplish it all on our own, but we don't need to do that. That's, that's contrary to what God wants to do. The picture was just really a, a celebration of us launching the local paper, put us in there. But the reason why I put that up is to explain, I didn't come here to Conestoga with the vision of having this church birth, right? Um, but there's a coaching company called Live With Purpose Coaching, and Live With Purpose Church is now the second prong, what we believe by faith over the upcoming years is going to become seven nonprofit and for-profit um, organizations that are going to be about making impact for God in different areas. We talked about being the church outside the church. Live With Purpose Coaching does that as marketplace ministry within business. 
Obviously, we are the church, so we can go out to minister to people and be the church outside the church. But it goes in many other areas of life, too, be it government, education, as, as Ryan and John were praying this morning, um, to bring the principles of God everywhere we go. Right? Those with the scriptures. And in, um, in closing, you know, there's, there's a lot more I could have said in, in that story. Uh, but I will say, <laughs> it, um, it's, been, it's been crazy. Like, the stuff, I mean, my wife, God bless her, the stuff she listens to, I, the more you obey him, the more he's going to show you. And yet, it can kind of scare you sometimes, but the reality is it shouldn't. Because when you actually, if God can speak to you and you can hear and understand God, and then you can actually do what God wants you to do, do you really think that you can come up with something better on your own? Honestly. Right? And so if we can, like that should excite us. That should take fear and transform that. We should be transformed by the renewal of our mind, as the word would say. And so in that, you could have, you know, this, you know, 30-something single guy living in town, a couple years later, leaves the suburbs, both my wife and I, to the country lifestyle, that does all these things, and here where we are, and, and my story is not unique. I was just obedient, and, you know, I truly want each of you guys and gals to do the very same things I'm doing. Maybe not the exact roles I'm doing, <laughs> but just to be obedient to him and to see what God's going to do. You know, he will, I guarantee you, make changes in your life if you will do that. And so, again, that might require you to step out of the boat and do things uh, as, the, as the boys left his father behind to, to follow Jesus. Again, I'm not saying leave your family, but that could require some tough things. That could require um, things that you'll, you'll not make certain friends with. Some people might not understand you. It could require a job change. It could require lots of things. Um, I don't know. Only God does. But I pray you'd be uh, obedient to Him. In closing, uh, I've received the book recently, which I... Some of the core team know that I talk about it a lot, but I, I, I bless Mel for giving it to me. I, I love the book. Um, Pastor Lester Zimmerman of Petra Church says this well. It's easy to sit in a room and talk about vision, as we've been doing today, but for a vision to become reality, it requires a lot of sacrifice and hard work. Okay? And physically, in some ways, I even, again, bless uh, Don, who's sitting in here, that it's done a lot of hard work with the space that we're renovating, that they ripped out an elevator and threw it up a level and, and just kind of started that process for us. So we bless him in that. Um, but again, the things I've talked about, you know, um, some of our, our families that are here that I know that travel a decent, a decent amount just to get here, because Conestoga is just not like next door for some people. Um, the things that we're going to have to do to prepare and be here for an early morning service, things that aren't comfortable <laughs> or perfect. Maybe some of you are morning people, so it was no big deal, but for a lot of people, there are things that uh, require a sacrifice. And so, wouldn't it be great if we could truly dedicate the balance of our lives to stewarding our most precious resource, which is time, in such a way, in the best way possible, truly, that we would do that by loving others as ourselves. And so I would challenge you today, if you could leave here and literally, a lot of times if you call me on my voicemail, unless I'm like off or, or whatever, I, if I change the voicemail, it'll, it'll tell you to go do something unexpected for somebody today, to show them how much you care and how much you love them. And to challenge you, because tomorrow you might not even be here. You hear stuff like that. Somebody goes for a run, they pass over and die. Um, I'm not trying to close on the down point, just saying that go do something today to show love to somebody else. Something surprising, you know? If you got anything out of my message today, that's your first step of obedience, okay? Not just to me, but pray first and let God show you what you should do and then just do it, right? Can we close, uh, bow our heads in prayer? Thank you, Father God, for who you are. You are worthy, God. 
Father, I ask that you would teach each of us how to fully trust you and obey you and be surrendered to your Holy Spirit's leading in our lives, that you'd fill us with faith, Father God. We know that your perfect love casts out all fear. So I pray and impart over these people a spirit of faith and courage as you gave to Caleb and Joshua in your scriptures. God, I pray this over these people, God, that they would believe for different things. No matter how physically weak or strong, young or old they are, they would believe for greater things, God. They would be burdened, God, with the reality that they need to obey you in their lives. And so the things that they already know that you want them to do, may your will be done on earth as it already is in heaven in their lives, Father God. I want to ask, now each of you, there's three people that I'm wanting to connect with. And if it's um, any of you guys, as you keep eyes closed and heads bowed, if this is you, I would just simply ask that you would raise your hand. First, first person, if you want to take God's challenge to live out this higher purpose that we're talking about, the one that he has for you, but you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. And, and knowing that it's a free gift from God that He gives, I invite you, if that's you today, that you say, yes, I want to know this higher purpose for my life, God. I've never fully understood, and I don't understand it all, but in this moment, I want to obey you, and I want to step forward in that. I want to receive this free gift. I want you to change my life. If that is you, I would just ask that you would raise your hand. Thank you. I see that hand. I see that hand. By faith, we say yes and amen. And second, secondly, if you've already accepted Jesus Christ and His free gift of salvation, and you've made Him Lord of your life, but you desire to walk forward from this place of worship today, embracing God's challenge to live your life for His higher calling, if that's you, if you want to put that faith into action, I pray that you would raise your hand today as well, that we could see you by faith step into that. Yes, I see those hands. I see those hands. And I believe the angels are rejoicing on high as they see your faith and your obedience. And the third person is this. Maybe you follow Christ, but you aren't clear on what His higher calling is for your life specifically. And if that's you, that's okay. You might not know what that is. But today, if you would value prayer, that the Holy Spirit might impart and inspire that vision that God has already placed in you, so you can see it and connect with that reality, if that's you, I'd ask that you would raise your hand. If you want to know the higher purpose that God has for you, I would ask by faith that you would raise your hand and say yes and amen to that. I see that. I see those hands. I ask in closing, for each of those people that raise their hands, we want to love on you as we end. I would ask that you would step forward so we can pray for you guys. And you're uh, f free as, uh, to stay as long as you want until we need to, to leave out. But again, I would just say, Father, bless each of them. Bless them for their faith, God that they've shown today. God, I ask that you would show the reality of your purpose and your vision for their lives. We say thanks for the salvation of the, of the faithful gentleman who raised his hand. We say that you would now anoint them and appoint them for a time and season such as this to be a wrecking ball for your glory, God, that they would understand your purposes for their lives and they would teach others, God, that... that it's not just for them, but they can be used to inspire other people to believe by faith that the very same thing can happen to them. God, we pray as time would continue that you would use our ministry to help to truly train and nurture them up and to follow your Holy Spirit's leading. In Jesus' name, amen. For those that did, raise your hand. Like I said, if you guys could step forward. And, I, and, and we just want to, again, pray over you guys uh, simply. Um, and uh, 
yeah, you're blessed for being here and go, go in peace. I did, yeah.